Hey, Rocky Fork, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will stay connected by downloading our app. You know, I really love that. The, the opener for, uh, for Jesus Next Door, but that's kind of special. I kind of like that. So, good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the ministers here, and I am, uh, I am just so glad to be with you. I want to welcome you all here. If it's your first time, welcome. If it's your 50th time, welcome. If it's your 500th time, welcome. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad to be worshiping with you and praising God with you. Uh, it's good to be in his house this morning. Amen? So we're in the middle of this sermon series called Ordinary. It is not an ordinary sermon series. It's called Ordinary. Um, and it's all about how God works in the lives of ordinary people, ordinary people like you and me. We are God's chosen instruments to bring people the good news of the hope that Jesus offers. We are his chosen instruments. There is no plan B. We are plan A. There is no plan B. We are his instruments. I want you to think about this for just a second. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus started his ministry, and, and he got to pick his team. It's like playing dodgeball. You get to pick your team, right? And so what does he do? He could pick anybody. He could pick people who have influence and power. He could pick rabbis and teachers. He could pick, he could pick politicians and businessmen. He could have picked anyone. Who did he choose? He chose ordinary people. That's who he chose. He chose fishermen and tax collector and a zealot, a rebel. He chose ordinary people. He, he chose a tent maker to speak to the Gentiles. He could have chosen anyone, and he chose these people. And with that ordinary team, Jesus built an organization the church that has endured for 2,000 years. Not just endured, but has changed the world. Like, that's amazing. That's what God does with ordinary people. So why do you suppose he chose ordinary people? Why do you suppose? I would say, this is a little dangerous, right? So, powerful people have a tendency to think they can do it themselves. Like, I've got all the power I need to do everything I need to do. But Jesus knew that what he was asking, they couldn't do on their own. He knew that he was going to need people that would have to rely on him. And so he chose ordinary people. He chose ordinary people and then he empowered them. He said, you, I have empowered you with the gifts to, to heal people and to cast out demons. Go and do that. And then after, so he, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, and then he ascends into heaven. And what does he leave as a gift? He leaves the Holy Spirit. He leaves them with the Holy Spirit and says, the Holy Spirit will empower you now to do all of these things. And it's, it's amazing that he does that. But can I just tell you, the same spirit that he empowered the apostles with, he empowers us with. It's the same spirit today. There is, there is nothing different about the Holy Spirit from 2,000 years ago to now. He is the same. And so that power that they have, it resides in us now. It resides in us now. And so that's what we've been talking about for the past few weeks, is how the Holy Spirit empowers us and fills us so that our behavior becomes more and more like the character of God. The fruit of the Spirit is displayed in us and Paul tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. This has been our theme verse throughout this series, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Paul tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Paul says, look, 
you look in chapter 5, Paul says, we can rely on ourselves. We can try that. If we do, we're bound to give in to our wants and our desires. He calls those things acts of the flesh. But he says, we have a choice. We can choose to fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit instead. So instead of relying on ourselves and doing the things that the world does, we rely on the Spirit and we do the things that the Spirit does. We act in ways the Spirit leads. And so we've been talking about that for the past few weeks. We started with with the idea of love. Love being a foundational thing. It, it It is an essential element to everything in Christian behavior. Jesus says in John 13, he says that that people will know that we are his by our love for other people. The fruit of love comes out of us. They will know that we're followers of Jesus. We also talked about how we can have patience. We can have patience in the middle of trial because we have the Spirit empowering us. And we, we read that, that he doesn't give us any temptation that he hasn't equipped us to handle or given us a way out. He does that. He empowers us in the midst of trial. And then last week we talked about kindness and goodness, and we put those two things together. And we looked at Ephesians 4 and Paul talking about things that we do and things that we say and how those, if we're just kind and good... We see a different outcome. We said speaking the truth is goodness and in love is kindness, right? So speaking the truth in love is goodness and kindness. For going unwholesome talk is goodness. Building one another up is kindness. You get the idea. This week we're going to talk about another favorite variety of fruit. I don't know why I got all the hard ones, but this week's fruit is self-control. No one in this room struggles with self-control. I know it. None of you had trouble getting up this morning. No. Yeah. (laughs) I had trouble getting up this morning. I don't know about you, but so self-control is what we're going to talk about. Um, So I just want to hit on this idea of of fruit being something that is evidence of what is in us. Jesus is, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches um, this crowd of people, Matthew 7. He teaches this crowd of people, and he's teaching them how to tell the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. He's teaching them discernment. That's what he's teaching them. And this is what he says about how to discern what is true from what is false. In Matthew 7, starting in verse 15, he says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick graves from, or grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. By their fruit you will recognize them. What they say, what they do, is an overflow of what is inside of them. True prophet or false, you will tell by their fruit. That's how we'll know. So we're talking about the fruit of self-control today, so I'm going to ask a couple of hard questions. Have you ever known somebody who is quick-tempered? Me neither. Have you ever known somebody who like flies off the handle? Somebody who speaks rashly? How about somebody who's impulsive? 
You know anybody who's impulsive? Somebody who, who, who rushes to judgment, who gives in to temptation whenever they see it. Like those are the people that always buy a candy bar at the checkout in the grocery store. I might be that person. I don't know. Um, what do we typically say to people who have those issues? What do we typically say? Like when they fly off the handle, calm down, man. Control yourself. Get a hold of yourself. You better check yourself. Check your heart, man. Check your heart. See, the thing is, those are all real struggles. Those are all real struggles. And they're examples of a lack of self-control. And, and here's the thing. So, a lack of self-control is just evident everywhere around us. There, it, you, it is everywhere. Why control my appetite when I can supersize my value meal? Why wait till my store restocks when I can get it tomorrow from Amazon? Why control my sexual desires when pornography is available everywhere? Why? Why control my spending when I can just get a line of credit? All of those things are about self-control. But there's no need for us in our culture to, to control ourselves. Like our culture would teach us, we don't have to wait. We don't have to control ourselves. We don't have to. It's something that, that, that we have devalued in our culture. The idea of waiting, of, of self-control. Now hear me when I say this. I am not pointing fingers at anyone. I struggle with self-indulgence over self-control. I struggle with that. And I imagine I am not alone in this room. I think, I think everybody has some kind of struggle in this area. We could do an entire sermon series on different ways that we struggle with self-control. We could do that. But I want to talk about one area today. One area. And I think it's really important. And I think it's something that is probably a problem for more of us in this room than not. It's controlling what we say. Controlling the tongue. Nobody here has a problem with that, so we'll just move on. And amen. Um, show of hands. How many of you in this room have said something that you knew you should not have said? Okay. There are a couple of you who have your hands down. <laughs> you're, my, you're my examples. Um, show of hands. How many of you have ever lost control and let a bad word slip out of your mouth? Me neither. <laughs> right? Yeah. So <laughs> the truth is, it, it is a struggle for a lot of us. Controlling the tongue is a major struggle. And can I just share with you, you are not alone. The reason I had you raise your hand is because you can look around the room and see that you are not alone in your struggle. But it's not new. It's been going on for thousands of years. That's why we read about it in Scripture. James teaches about the struggles of the tongue. James is Jesus' half-brother and a leader in the first century church. And he teaches about struggles with what we say. Listen to what he says in James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says this, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James is such a great writer because he speaks to us in practical terms. How do we apply God's word and will to our lives? How do we do that? We find that all throughout the book of James, so it's not surprising that he would speak to us about one of the most common struggles we have. That's what we say. It's what we say. It is a problem that is common to all of us. So what does James tell us? He tells us three things, really. The first thing he tells us is this, the tongue is powerful. The tongue is powerful. What we say has power. Good or bad, what we say has impact on ourselves and on the people around us. And and James uses analogies to, to make the point. He says we use a bit to steer an entire horse. We use a rudder to, sh- to steer an entire ship. A small spark can start a great fire. James is saying that even though the mouth, the tongue, is a small part of the body, it is an incredibly influential part. So James tells us the tongue is powerful. The second thing he tells us is that God desires that we would use our tongue to bring him glory. But we use it instead to do both praising and cursing. Again, he uses analogies. He uses analogies. He says a spring bears or has fresh water or salt water. A fig a fig tree bears figs, not olives. James is saying, look, what God desires is for us to be consistent consistently good that's what he desires from us but and this is the third thing he teaches he says we are going to fall short in our efforts we are going to fall short in our efforts no human can tame the tongue is what james says even though we can't we're we're Every one of us is going to fail in this area. That doesn't mean we get to stop trying. That has got to be the goal. It has got to be where we're headed. We have got to be looking to be more Christ-like in our speech. More and more and more. James teaches us that we cannot control the tongue on our own. The reality is self-control if it's based on yourself, is not enough. Self-control is not enough. We need something more to be able to rein in our speech. So what is that something more? Well, if you flip over a couple of pages in your Bible, another leader in the early church, Peter, tells us exactly what we need to get the job done. Second Peter chapter 1 starting in verse 3 Peter says this. He says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. 
Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world uh, in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self control, and to self control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that passage is so powerful. Peter talks about some of the same things that Paul did in Galatians, right? He talks about faith and goodness and self-control and perseverance and love. He talks about all those things. But the way Peter describes it is really interesting, he says, he says that it's this combination of all of these things that lead us to be effective witnesses for Christ. It is this, this combination, bringing it all together. And, and the way he writes it is like, you start with faith. You start with faith, and, and your faith will lead you to goodness. And so you add goodness to faith. And your goodness will lead you to self-control. And so you add self-control to goodness and faith. And as you add those things, in increasing measure, we become more and more like Christ. Peter reminds us that it is a process. You don't... (laughs) When you come up out of the water, you are not instantly like Jesus. That's not the way it works. If I plant a tree, if I plant a sapling today, you will not see fruit on that tomorrow. It is a process. There is growth that has to happen. The right conditions have to exist. And so Peter tells us we start with the basic and we add to it each of these things. And we add to it and we add to it and we add to it until we are bearing fruit that looks like the character of Jesus. That's what he says. We need to continue to pursue his character. Can I just tell you, there is not a single point before we reach heaven where we have arrived. There is not a single point this side of heaven where we have arrived and we can just, okay, we're good now. We don't have to keep adding. We've made it. You haven't made it till you got there, right? You haven't made it till you got there. We, we have to continue, continue, continue to pursue him. And when we do, the fruit of his character will become more and more evident in our lives. But I want to circle back to something that is so critical for us to understand, and it's from verse 3, Right? Peter reminds us in verse 3, he says, he says, God has given us everything we need, all the power we could ever need to control our tongue, to control ourselves. He possesses, and he has freely given it to us. All the power we need, he has freely given. And when you consider it from, from that perspective... Self-control really isn't the right term, is it? Self-control isn't really the right term. If it all comes from Him, if self-control is a characteristic of the Father, if it's a characteristic of the Spirit in us, the practical application of Peter's message is we can only control the tongue if we fully rely on God. If we fully rely on Him to be the guard of our mouth. That's what it boils down to. And so if you look at the, at the, the Greek at what, that Paul uses, that Peter uses for self-control, this is what it actually means. It means mastery of something within yourself, but not by yourself. Mastery within yourself, but not by yourself. It literally only happens, self-control literally only happens when we give up control. 
So, in that sense, as believers, it's not self-control at all. It's spirit control. It's not self-control, it's spirit control. And what's really cool about this, what's really amazing, is that when you understand that concept, that when you understand that, it is so freeing. It is so freeing. Uh, <laughs> Self-control happens when we give control away. We're tempted to sin. Okay, how many of you think, I'm tempted, I need to try really hard not to sin? Is that where you're at? Like, isn't that what we do? Man, I just, maybe if I just set up some controls and maybe if I just try really hard. Peter tells us, Paul tells us, James tells us, Jesus tells us that no matter how hard we try, we're going to inevitably fail. If self-control is all on you, you will fail. You will. But if in the midst of temptation we say, Spirit, lead me. If we, in the midst of temptation, we say, Spirit, lead me. And we give up control. We're relying on a power that's greater than us, greater than our temptation. And then self-control is what flows out of us because it's really spirit control. Self-control is spirit control. That's what it is. So what does that look like practically? What does it look like practically? So I'm going to read a couple of verses from from Psalms, from David. Psalm 141, verse uh, 3 and 4. David says this, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. He says, Don't let my heart be drawn to what is evil, so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. So here, here's, you want to live out this practically? You want to see what it looks like practically? I want you to just take verse 3. And I want you to memorize verse 3. I want you to memorize verse You don't have to do it right this second. Like you can read your Bible later. It's okay. But, but I want you to memorize Psalm 141.3. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I want you to memorize that, and I want you to speak that as a prayer before every conversation you have. When you get up in the morning, when you get up in the morning, set a guard over my mouth today, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Before you go into a meeting, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch at the door of my lips. The things that you do, leave it in his hands. How much better, how much better would our communication be if that was the attitude that we took into every conversation? If that was the attitude that we took into every conversation, We don't have the power to control the tongue, but the Spirit does. And so that's what we're asking Him by repeating that psalm. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. We can have hard conversations if we start with that prayer. We can say difficult things to people if we start with that prayer. What if... What if before you had something difficult to say someone, you said, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And then you had that hard conversation. And you tackled that tough topic. How much better would your conversation be if it was guided by the Spirit? We can confess weakness We can confess our sins to one another. If we start from this place, we don't have to be afraid of doing that. 
We don't have to be afraid at all to have those conversations because we have asked him to set a guard over our mouth to keep watch over the door of our lips. And so we can say difficult things. We can be honest about our failures. We can. And we can, when we, ha- when we say that prayer first, those difficult things, we say them with gentleness and love and kindness. That sounds like fruit, doesn't it? It sounds like fruit. We can be critical of people without criticizing them. You know the difference, right? So I can be criti- I can observe something that you do and see something wrong, and I can be critical of that. And I can tell you, I think these things were, weren't done correctly. Or I can say, you are a terrible human being. Right? That's criticizing. We can be critical if we start from the place of, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If we start there, then every conversation we have, it's him doing the talking. It's him. And how much better would our conversations be? We can build one another up in truth, in love, in mercy, in grace, because he is keeping watch over our mouth. So that's your assignment for the week. That's your assignment. Should you choose to accept it? Memorize that verse and start your day with it. Start your conversations with it. Start, start with this. Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And watch what happens in every conversation you have. Is it going to be perfect? No. Because everything this side of heaven isn't. But is it going to be better? You bet. That is, I I can promise you, it will be better. Say that this week. Let, Let the Spirit speak. And when you speak, speak Jesus. Would you stand with us as we praise Him?